Cool. Hi everyone, um, I'm Ezreal and today we're going to look at pro uh, procedural macros. Procedural macros. Okay, so uh, agenda, we'll look at why, why macros. We'll look at how Rust does um, declarative macros, which is macro rules. And uh, we'll see uh, why and what procedural macros are. We'll see some live demos of each of the different um, procedural macro types, as well as learnings I've um, encountered while using pro uh, proc macros, and an informative set of um, slides at the end. Okay, so macros. Why would you use macros? So, um, three primary reasons to make code more ergonomic to write, to reduce duplication when you're writing code, and reduce boilerplate. So this is uh, similar for all kinds of languages, uh, programming languages. So in Rust, we shall see how we can increase ergonomics using proc macros. Um, th this is just a, a demo. We'll we'll actually go into how it's done later. So if you make this big and you don't do this, so when we're writing a when when we are implementing a trait for a type in Rust, we tend to have to import the trait and then um, write the implementation. So right here, I've got a type called health points, which is a new type. A new type just means it's a single tuple type over uh, an inner type. And right now, the inner type is an unsigned 32-bit integer. So if I want to be able to go health points plus another health points, I would have to impl add for that health points type. Uh, if I want to go health points plus equals another uh, health points, I need to go able add a sign, so on and so forth for sub and sub assign. Now that's um, like 34 lines of code, but if we have a derived macro to help shorten the code, all of these uh, code about adding and add assigning, sub and sub assigning um, a type to itself, it's really easy to understand the concept. I'm just adding an integer the inner type of this health points to mm -hmm. another integer, the inner type of another health points. So conceptually, it's a lot of boilerplate to have to write, um, say, six lines of code per concept. Whereas if we can shorten that to this, where we've got derives, where we've got um, one derive per trait, we can see that all of that information is captured in just four words. So we've shortened the amount of code we've written, and we've not actually decreased our understanding of the concept. It's, it's quite ergonomic. And when you're reviewing code, if we know that this, these uh, traits, sorry, these uh, derives are tested nicely, we know that we don't have to test the implementation of those traits for every single type that we are uh, implementing add and um, the other traits on. So, that's one of the benefits. We can reduce duplication. So let's close those. So let's say we are we, we, we are really happy with derive um, derived macros and we implement a lot of them for a particular struct. Now um, if we have two new types, one health points, one skill points, which have very similar um, meaning, well, similar uh, structure. This is still a lot of duplication. Even though we've reduced all of those trait implementations down to single um, word or paths, we still have duplication across our multiple types. Why do you have to put the derive macro in front of the add? Um, so right now I'm not importing the derive more um, crate, or I'm uh, not importing the yeah, um, yeah, yeah, I'm not importing the uh, derived macro in a use statement, so I can reference it directly in the um, attribute. Yeah. Yep, so this is, uh, there's still duplication across multiple types here. And if we want to deduplicate that, we can use another type of pr procedure macro called um, attribute macros. And this thing allows us to do arbitrary code manipulation with our item. So um, if I write a procedure macro called numeric new type and it generates all of those derives, 
then I have again reduced the uh, amount of code that has to be written for multiple types. This, uh, at least for this transformation, you do need to understand what this macro does to understand those. But um, uh, so these these are self-explanatory. Uh, these ones are not. So usually you want to have uh, good docs to link where this comes from. Okay. So the third benefit is to reduce boilerplate. So let's say I want to write a web application. Um, in Rust, this is all you need. You need 10 lines. Well, you need, you need the cargo um, descriptor as well for importing Rocket. But normally, when setting up a web application, you have to deal with, say, you want to bind some, well, you need to grab a socket for some address and handle what happens if that part is already taken, and so on and so forth. All of this can be hidden behind a, a procedural macro. So in this case, the Rocket Web Framework uh, gives you this get proc macro. And anything that, um, well, when you run this program, anything that sends a request to hello slash name slash age will get a string returned back to the uh, web request using hello, um, name year old, name sorry, age year old named name. So um, all of that is hidden behind this procedural macro. And conceptually, when someone's trying to develop a web application, they don't have to think about all of those low-level details. And so by using macros, you get to reduce all of that boilerplate. Saves a lot of dev time. Cool. So pretty fast, but uh, we do need to do that. All right, so before we go into uh, procedural macros, we're going to take a look at at macro rules, which is the declarative macros um, that you can write in Rust. So macro rules, um, as a refresher, um, guys can see it. Um, so you have, uh, you, you write a rule that says, let me match a pattern, in this case, nothing, and let me generate some output tokens. So in this case, uh, when someone calls a hello macro uh, with any of these scope delimit uh, parentheses delimiters, we will just uh, print hello. So if we do that, oh, we, you can see, hey, something changed. All right, uh, it didn't really carry across. All right, so if we run that, you can see that we actually get hello, hello, hello. All right. Now, um, macro rules um, is happy to take any token tree which is well formed. Well formed being, if you have an open bracket, you need to have a closed close bracket. It's not happy to take, um, say, a single left brace or a single double quote. You need to close them properly. So, um, if you are uh, bored, you can do something like have a uh, well, try to implement Java in Rust, and <laughs> yeah, and so this, this actually runs. So you get JRust. Cool. Yeah, but um, the thing with macro rules is items that are match in patterns. So you've got rules here to match certain patterns. They are captured as whole items, and so can uh, they cannot be broken down within the macro body. What that means is, let's say I'm capturing, um, let's go up one slide. If I am capturing each of these tokens individually, um, like static void, and here's a variable to capture the ident here. This is an ident identifier. If I want to capture this whole thing as a block, so that a block, it, a block will capture uh, a brace delimited um, set of uh, statements. If I capture it as a block, I cannot actually pass it down to another rule which will deconstruct that block into separate tokens. And it's quite difficult to understand the error message that comes out from Rust. So if we actually run that, it will say, uh, it'll say, no rules expected this to for this token because that token is captured as a whole. Whereas this uh, rule is trying to parse them as parts. And even though this rule is 
correct, uh, rust will not actually pass it down, and it is really difficult to, uh, well, when you first implement macros, you can't tell that this is um, not actually being parsed by rust. It's it looks as well from the from the from the error message. You will intuitively think that oh, I've got this rule wrong, and you, you spend ages trying to fix this rule, but actually it's not your fault. Yep, it's just um, the gap between the error message and uh, what you think it means. So that's a lot of the um, pain points of macro rules, and so we're going to look at. Uh, procedural macros. But first, uh, does anyone have any questions or comments? None. Alright. So, either you all understood that or you all did not. <laughs> we, we, we will find out. <laughs> Alright, so procedural macros. So, um, proc macros are macros defined with procedural code, which means tokens from your source code are parsed into an abstract syntax tree. You can write procedural code to reason over that um, AST, and then generate output tokens. And uh, it's not hygienic by default. Who knows what hygiene means? Yeah, one, one. <laughs> All right. uh, did you, would you like to try to explain it? Um, it's basically if you declare a, like if you write a procedural macro that declares a variable the compiler will take this variable name, compare it against the rest of your real code, and if it's the same, it will give you an error message. Whereas within like a declarative macro, it's hygienic, so if you declare a variable within a declarative macro, uh, the Rust compiler will make that variable different from the rest of your code, even if it's the same name. So this avoids like conflicts and weird error messages if you have the same variable name by accident. Nice. So it's not hygienic. It's not hygienic. Like C, then. Correct. It's yeah. uh, but you can enable the proc macro hygiene feature, which is nightly only right now. Oh, okay. Nice. So yeah. Yeah. Oh, one other thing. Yeah. I think proc macros are Turing complete, right? Are, are they? Do you know? I don't know. I I, I think so. Well, well, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> well, right. which, which means is you can you can do universal computation. Which means you can do anything. Oh, with it. So yes. You can program. Yes, you can program anything in it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Which makes it very powerful. Yes. So, um, what they look like? There's three flavors. The first is the function-like flavor, which looks pretty much like the uh, declared macros. Uh, it's just your uh, macro name, uh, uh, an exclamation mark, and um, some param parameters. You can do your custom derives, so you've seen the derive more add earlier, and you can do custom attributes. We also briefly <coughs> showed that earlier. So, um, why do we? Why should we use proc macros? So, for users, you get uh, better error messages. So, uh, when something fails, you don't simply get uh, no no rule match for this pattern. Um, you, you you can actually give error messages such as um, you specified this thing incorrectly or um, we expected this type to exist. So you can do that. There's nicer syntax uh, when you're writing it. And for developers, you're parsing an AST, an abstract syntax tree, instead of matching patterns. So say if you have a function with lifetimes um, in the declarative macro, if you need to have those lifetimes as uh, named tokens, you need to have a different pattern for each of those variants. If uh, in, in procedural macros, you can just parse the whole thing as an item, also a function or a struct or enum, and then uh, if there's lifetimes or type parameters, you can get it out of the abstract sy syntax tree. You can write procedural logic, so um, we'll, we'll look at this uh, later. There's better, diagno better diagnostics, so when you do have a mistake, um, you, you get the Rust compiler support to uh, see where um, you, you go wrong. It's easy to test. So you can write unit tests for um, 
your procedural macros or integration tests and or you need to write your procedure macros inside a dedicated crate so you can't just have like macro rules within the same crate and use it uh, straight away why is that because you need to uh, modify how the compiler sees uh, t uh, attributes or uh, derives yeah, so the compiler must have the knowledge of the macro before it can compile a crate yeah, uh, I thought we can articulate that better. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. So, we're going to look at the function like um, cell. Um, does anyone have any questions about the concept so far? None. Okay. So, function like, um, it looks like these. And so, what it does, it takes any well formed tokens. Um, again, uh, you have to have matching brackets. It outputs replacement tokens, so everything within the function, like macro, all of that gets fed into the macro, and the macro determines what it outputs. So if you want to output nothing, you can do that. If you want to output what it, what got fed in, you can do that. Or you can also um, output anything else you want. So we'll look at a demo f for this. So. Here is our function like macro and yeah, so first one, let's make that a little bit smaller. Okay. So um the one on top is just a function like macro with a lot of random tokens inside. And that corresponds to this procedural uh, macro definition. So we're not actually going to go through this tutorial style, I'm just gonna show you um what uh, it can do. So if we ignore the token stream completely and just return, say, a function um, called hello, returns a static string called rara, parse that into tokens and unwrap. Uh, again, don't do this. Um, the compiler will be happy. So if I save this, what will happen is this function uh, like macro will turn into, uh, well, it's going to turn into this. So it's going to generate this. So if we run this, ah, okay, it duplicated that because we've got the top one generated generates a function as well. So what um, to pr to prove that it exists, and there's two ways. Well, we'll look at one way first. So we're going to call the hello function, which we haven't declared in, in source code, but this, this macro will generate it, and the value that it returns is rara. And if we look at uh, the test for that. We're going to go down here. Uh, it's called test hello. You can see that the test will um, run happily. Okay, so um, if we want to make sure that we fail when the user has passed in things we don't, uh, we don't want to take, then we can say if we pass in something to this macro which says ensure that the token stream is empty, when we save it, we're going to get an error. And it says, we expected no arguments to this macro, which is exactly what I panicked with here. So uh, in, in that sense, you can give custom error messages, which is a lot nicer than, say, uh, could not match this, these tokens to this rule. Yeah. So if we take that away, it's going to be happy again. And we're going to look at another one, which is a bit more complicated. And this one we're going to see that we're going to rename a function to the name that we find inside its uh, function body. So we're going to rename this function called name into Tom, and we're going to rename a f this other function called name into Azrael. And what those functions will return would be the static string, um, which they each already contained. So Tom will return Tom, Azrael will return Azrael. Okay, so, um, well, technically the code is already written, so simply I just have to run it. And you can see that um, Tom test uh, and Azure test returned OK, where we asserted that Tom returned Tom and Azrael returned to Azrael. So um, over here, I'm going to give you a taste of what it's like to 
try and extract this tom and put it into there. So um, in our uh, function, sorry, in our macro definition called rename, <coughs> this rename maps to that thing. We want to parse the stream of tokens. So what we get in a function like macro is is uh, actually this whole thing, which is not commented code. This is our stream of tokens. We're going to parse that into an item function. Um, sin is a crate you will come across when you are uh, uh, going through the procedure macro tutorials. So uh, you just tell it, I want to parse um, the tokens as an item function. And um, I expect it to uh, parse successfully. If it, if someone gave us something other than a function, then we'll, we'll get an error. And in order to reach that tom, uh, so there's many, many layers. I'm going to expand this side a little more. So item function is our whole function. And we're going to look for the block, which is that block here. And within the block, there can be multiple statements. Um, it's uh, so called statements. And actually, I wanted to show you this traversal through here. So here's dots. Here's the dots for sin. What will happen? Uh, what will happen when you are writing a proc macro is you, what is um, you will traverse the whole tree and open many, many, many tabs. So um, so you've got item function. The block is the body of the function. You go into that, you see that you've got a uh, public field called statements. And what you tend to have to do is check whether you're going to look inside a field. Sometimes you would actually call a method, but most of the time <coughs> it would be a field or deconstructing a type. So you go into statements. Each statement can be one of many types of statements. This is kind of like looking at the structure of how um, it actually is um, looking at the structure of how Rust abstract syntax tree looks like. Um, the statement we are going to use, um, the, the docs are really good for determining what we want. We know that we are looking for a static string, so that's going to be a expression without trailing semicolon, so we go into that, and at the same time I'm going to flick back to here to show you that, hey, we went to um, your item function, your, your blocks, your statements. It was a vector, so we call first. We expect... We're not doing any error handling here, so we, we expect that we're going to grab that one statement out. Then we are going to deconstruct it. So this syntax is a bit foreign if you haven't um, come across Rust for uh, very long. What you can do is you can go if let, and then you can pass in many, many types to deconstruct an object into its lower fields, such that you can reference uh, one of the lower, lower fields, well, one of the fields in deep in the hierarchy. So what you don't have to do is, like in Java, you'd probably go call object.get field, get subfield, get another field. So, you, so in Rust, you don't have to call methods on that, you can deconstruct the type directly. So um, we'll, we'll be traversing like statement, uh, looking for an, a literal expression, uh, looking for a string literal, and then um, getting that uh, value of that st string. So, um, let's see, 34. Uh, we shall skip this traversal, but um, eventually what you would be doing is just expanding all of these um, doc blocks and going down into each of the variants. Okay, so um, what, what we <laughs> do with that a value is we'll just replace the function name and 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 write that out. So when we write it out, we need to convert from our type. So what we get here are, is an item function, which is a uh, strong type. We need to turn that into tokens that the Rust compiler can parse and uh, compile into your source code. So. We do two things. Well, we we use a create called quote, which turns your sin data types into a token stream of a different type to Rust token stream, and 
there's reasons for that, so we wouldn't go that, into that, I believe, today. And, and you can turn that special token stream into Rust version of the token stream. So, um, yeah, and there you have it, that's pretty fast, but uh, if you have any questions, um, actually, do you, does anyone have any questions right now? Yeah. yeah. In lines 28 to 30, you showed us how to uh, destructure yeah. Uh, oh, yeah, decent. And, and assign to a single variable. Yeah. What if the structure is not met? Then, um, so I've got a, an if let. So if let means we're going to, if it matches this um, destructure ring pattern, otherwise it will panic. So, yeah. Um, nice thing about this destructuring, or rather parsing, is um, if your item function is not uh, just a simple um, function, but it's actually a function with many things. So you've got a type parameter, it's got a um, trait bound. We, uh, this code will still happily work because um, sin is clever enough to uh, parse all of those into the abstract syntax tree, and it still can treat that as a function. And panic in this case means compiler error with this message. Uh, true. Uh, correct. So if I say I will change this tom into say one, it's going to uh, panic saying I expected a single string literal, and so um, it, that's this message here. So it did not meet my destructuring requirements. But if you find a, if you reach a panic line in your like in your executable, it will stop. This is compile time, so we haven't even compiled the crate. This is uh, part yeah, of the but when it's in the executable. Oh uh, yes. Yeah, unless you capture it somehow. So there are ways of capturing panics. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So if it touches the oh. syntax tree, that means macros can't access comments. Macros also. Yes and no. Wait. Uh, depends what you're doing. I don't think proc macros can access comments, but. There is the Rust's own um, syntax free compilation, which can. Yeah, so Rust's own syntax compilation crate is called um, uh, libsyntax. And if you're writing something like Rust format or Clippy and you need to uh, read that information, um, you want to go to that level, which is one level deeper. Yeah. <laughs> That, that, that level is pretty uh, complicated, so um, a lot of the types actually match up with sins types, but um, it's just a bit lower level. Okay, so uh, whoa, let's go back to here. Back to the slides. Um, yeah, we went through that. Be there. Yes, questions. Any more questions before I go on? No? Okay, we're all good. Alright, so derive macros. So it looks like this. You've got your derive, custom derive, and um, you can actually, from Rust, I think 130, I might be wrong, you can have your path to your uh, custom derive. So path being your, the create name that provides a custom derive. and um, So the derive applies the custom derive to your struct. Uh, correct. Yeah. Yeah. So for example, it was the derive more add was um, adding the add in, uh, trait implementation to my health points earlier. Okay, so so what uh, derived macros do? So they yeah, attach to a struct or an enum. Uh, you can only do this with your own type, so you, you can't do a, you can't add a derive to say um, a type alias. And uh, you can generate additional tokens. So what happens is you cannot manipulate this. You can add more code um, further down, but you cannot change this uh, actual uh, t uh, syntax tree. You can have helper attributes, uh, which mean, hmm, I think I have one example later on, we'll show, we'll show you that. And you cannot see the derived meta item, um, which is another way of saying, if you have code, uh, so if you have a custom derive which looks at this um, type, what you actually get is you you do get the comment. Uh, well, if it's triple slash, you will get the doc attribute um, passed into your token stream as well. Um, we'll we'll look at examples of this. Okay, so given the following, um, given the following code. 
so you have um, derived, so clones from standard library, this is the custom derived that we are going to look at. This is someone else's de custom derived and debug. This custom derived um, can declare that I want to have special attributes which can give me additional parameters to how I implement my derive. That, that's uh, probably better seen than heard. So we'll look at that really soon. So uh, what you oh, okay? So what the token stream that the custom derive will see is this. So documentation for a struct is seen as an attribute. So it's a it's a meta attribute to the struct. Even if it is uh, written on top as a triple slash, that is passed as a um, part of the token stream to your um, custom derived implementation. And you, you can see other people's attributes on your struct, but you cannot see the derive attribute. So that means if you want a custom derive to say, if this struct derives clone as well, do something else, you cannot do that. You could in, I think, earlier versions of the proc macro um, support, but they've re removed that. So um, we will actually look at, uh, we'll, we'll do a live demo just after this. So what you can do, you can generate impulse blocks. So derive add will let you impulse add for your type. Um, you can generate more types. So if you say, I want to, for derive foo, generate a struct called foo bar, you can do that as well. And what you cannot do is mutate the type, at least not with uh, derived macros. You can do that with another kind of macro we'll see later on. Okay, so derived macros, we'll look at the derived macro create. Uh, oh, sorry, this one. And this guy. So, derive new. So let's say we want to derive a new um, constructor or function constructor that just returns um, a new instance of our struct. So we can implement a derive new really, really quickly by going um, pragmatical derive new. So this is what people will fill in in here. And um, you parse your syntax tree as a derive input. That is the type that syn provides for structs and enums. And um, the structure, uh, you, you have to look into the syn documentation. It's uh, really good, again. And what you can do is, so again, we use quote and say, when we see anything with derive new, we're going to look at the type's name, which is my struct in this case. We're going to generate an impl block which says, all right, we'll impl name, give it a function new, which returns self. Self is an alias um, that Rust has for each type uh, when you're <coughs> impling the type, implementing a type. And it's just going to return a new version, a new, a new instance of itself. And you can see here I'm adding my own documentation string. So um, you can see that this compiles um, nicely. Um, I can prove that it does not if I do this. So my struct new doesn't exist until I uh, derive new. And I can call it. And what this will generate, I think, I think it doesn't generate too much, so we can do this. So cargo expand is a really useful tool to see what tokens are generated when you um, are writing procedural macros, and actually any macros. So if your, if your macro generates syntactically complete um, tokens, it will output those tokens. Otherwise, uh, you're on your own, because it will, if you have broken tokens, it will just say it's broken and you don't get any output at all. So uh, what we get for derive new is, you can see that I've got my struct. It um, has this impl my struct function new and returns a new my struct, which is exactly the code that um, this thing um, produces. OK, 
Okay, so so cargo uh, cargo X band is really nice uh, for figuring out what your macro is actually producing. Okay, so um, let's see, number five. We will do we will do show attribute. Yeah. Okay, so show attribute. Uh, show full bar. No, I think a full bar is probably better. All right, do we have full bar here? No, I don't actually have a. Okay, I do not give. Uh, I did not create an example of a full bar, unfortunately. Okay, we'll we'll go. At sh uh, we'll look at show attribute. So show attribute is a derive that uh, will show us what attributes a proc macro can see. And it's got a show attribute helper um, attribute. And what that means is when I derive show attribute, I can also um, have this show attribute as an attribute. And I will p uh, pass a parameter to tell me what um, what's the value of the um, parameter attribute. So if I say doc here, um, I want to see what's the pr uh, value of the doc attributes. And again, we're going to use cargo expand and run that here. So this will show us that for a struct of attributes, which is uh, this struct, we'll look at the doc attribute, which is all of these. And the implement the implementation of this will just um, return a uh, sorry it will generate a function called attribute list, which returns a vector of the attribute list. Uh, sorry, a vector of the values of the attribute that we are inspecting. Hopefully, I uh, haven't lost anyone <laughs> yet. All right, so um, for the doc attribute, we can see that we've got these three. Okay, now, um, has anyone got questions about this? Yeah? Do you think the runtime error on the line of code that was generated inside the purpose? What kind of error is it? Let's find out. Yeah. So, runtime error, so yeah. like a. Oh, wait, uh, whoops, it has to be outside. So, oh, actually, you will get the um, panic error message um, in your code. So, we do that. Ah, oh, we need to actually make it compile. So over here we will get um, eventually uh, um, our message. Uh, yeah. That, that's time. Oh, compile time. Oh, just compile time. Yeah. Oh, a run time. Like say, I ah, I see. Oh, uh, uh, I true. What, I see. Yeah, what line of code will it point to and say? I don't know. Does yeah, it work? Like, yeah. Let's try this. Oh, oh well. Yeah, um, <laughs> co co yeah, compiler's still good. Yeah. <laughs> oh, wait, uh, wait, 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 wait. Let's help the compiler. Uh, uh, I think I need to unsafe this. <laughs> I, I don't know. <laughs> uh, I think that's alright. Um, okay. Oh no, it still checks that. <laughs> yeah, we, you, need, you need something else. <laughs> Alright, yeah, yeah we'll, we'll figure out at some point. Yeah, cool. So, so attribute macros. So, anyone else got questions on derived macros before we go on? No, okay, so attribute macros. So, attribute macros are the more powerful form of, say, derived macros. They're actually a bit, they're actually. Maybe somewhere between function like and the derived macros. So, what they look like is uh, we'll look at what they look like. So, it's this thing. So, the attribute macros um, take in a syntax tree and outputs replacement tokens. So, what that means is whatever you take in, you can decide to remove it completely or you can decide to re re uh, just um, output it as is, or you can do other transformations. So, yeah, that's what I said. So, um, we saw this rocket earlier. We're going to look at this. So, 
this new new type macro. Mm. <laughs> Excuse me. Can I get some water? This new uh, this new new type macro is a pro macro um, I've written to derive all of these um, derivations on new types uh, on on numeric new types, and I use that in my game. So um, health points, and I have something else called a weight, which is just a clock ticker. But um, we'll actually see what the use of a no up as well as a blank. Uh, remove um, attribute macro is. So for that one, let's go to the next tab. So for our no up uh, macro, we take in a token stream of an item and we just return the item. So it looks like I'm doing a no up um, I am, but there is some use to that. So um, if we look here, We've got uh, no ups on all of these things, as well as some commented out no ups. What uh, happens? Well, when I save it, nothing happens. But if I uncomment this, the no up um, macro will actually cause Rust compiler to also check is the attribute um, is the attribute applying to something that it should be applied to with. Ah, why is it not going to the end? And all right, for some reason, end goes to home of the previous line. But um, um, we can trigger compiler errors with um, uh, attributes. So that, that's that's one use of a no up attribute. Another use is similar. I think it's this one. We can get um, actual invalid Rust. So um, Rust doesn't want to parse this uh, in the syntax tree. Where, uh, whereas over here it is parsable, but it's just um, experimental. So th that's what you can use this attribute for, but but no um, real practical use. Okay, so um, the other one, the remove, the remove attribute, will just return you no tokens for anything you tag or remove onto. So over here, uh, you can see that if this struct is private. Um, and I tag it with remove. Um, Rust doesn't warn me with any um, warnings. But if I comment out the remove uh, attribute, it's going to complain saying, hey, this struct is never constructed. That's because the attribute itself will remove the item from the compilation process uh, when it's tagged. So, um, yeah, an another um, trivial um, attribute macro. No, no real use case. J just enough for demonstration. Okay, and there's one thing I do want to show you about attribute macros where you have to be careful. So, the numeric new type macro um, I showed you earlier. So what that does is, on a health points object, when I um, tag it with numeric new type, it's going to give me these derives and the thing is you have to handle the cases where there are existing derives on the um, health points type and earlier we saw with the derive mode macro we could not see the derive attribute but with the attribute macro we can't and therefore we can say all right we're going to parse this um, attribute look at the existing values and do some intersection with that so we can tell whether the user has already specified some of the derives that we want to add or has not. And we can do some error handling based on that. So um, just a quick um, demonstration. If I add the add macro, which is already added by the attribute macro, I will get a warning, come on, or, or an error. Eventually it'll compile. While it does, while it does, <laughs> I will show you the code for that. So um, inside the procmacro attribute definition, we're going to look at the types attributes, and inside there, we're going to. So here we first list the 
derives that we want to add to the type, then we intersect that with the existing derives. So we'll look at the existing derives, um, look, look for the meta list which has the derived name. So that is literally looking at uh, this guy. And uh, when we find the existing derives, we're going to uh, intersect that with the derived list that we want to add to that type. We find we find anything that exists. If there are any intersecting types, so it's not empty, then we're going to give the user a warning, and we give them uh, an error message which they can reason over. So if we look at the error message, it's going to say, hey, these are already automatically derived when the numeric new type attribute is used, and we tell them, uh, we tell them add. So this is all in the um, panic message. Right now, Rust does not have support to um, actually annotate the source code with here's the actual token where the error occurs. So that doesn't open ticket. So um, this is much nicer than say if you use well if you try to use a declarative macro, it's going to be really really difficult to actually um, handle like multiple derives. Okay, so um, at least we can at least we can give um, the user a better user experience with proc macros. Okay, so yep, um, I think um, that's all I had for attribute macros. Anyone have questions for that? Information dense. <laughs> all right. Um, okay, let's see. So reader, everyone's reading. <laughs> All right, so part macros. How um, so we got a few minutes left. So does the blog post? Um, Alex Crichton wrote this um, end of last year. Uh, it, it's a really good uh, start to uh, writing part macros. And does the reference book? It's also really good. Um, I use this. I actually use this to write this presentation. <laughs> All right, and. Creates your encounter sin quote proc macro, which is th this one's actually from the standard library, and the other three are not. Um, and uh, th there's a summary of what each crate is. Um, yeah, we don't have time to go through this, but um, have a read, and you'll probably figure it out a lot more when you actually play with proc macros. Okay, some learnings. Um, use qualified type names when referring to a known type of trait. So um, we'll, we'll, we'll skip ahead. So if you're going to return, if you're going to generate code that returns a result, it is good to qualify that type name because result is easily overloaded with different namespaces. And so if you're going to say, I return a result, but the user or the consumer of that macro imports their own create result with, say, one type parameter, quite common, um, it's going to cause a compilation error with your um, macro. So use a qualified name if you can, or well, if you know that the type isn't going to change its namespace. If you don't know that, then um, there's this other guideline where if you are generating code which says, I'm going to implement, so sorry, that's a line, if I'm going to implement a trait for a type, for an unqualified name, if you use an unqualified name, the user has to import the trait, but that means um, if your trait actually comes from, say, specs, uh, we don't need to, the, the consumer does not have to uh, import specs in their cargo descriptor. You can just reuse the re-exported trait from, say, Amethyst. Yep, I'm missing context for you guys, but um, yeah, <laughs> sorry. So um, if you do use the qualified name, then what the user has to do is to to import both amethyst and specs, or import amethyst and um, rename the uh, usage. It's not very ergonomic. So um, non-qualified names, there's use cases for that, but um, it's really depending on whether your repository is going to be used by multiple people or you control the whole project and you know the path um, for sure. All right, um, learnings. So a bit more. 
prefix. So if you have attribute helpers for a custom derive, prefix those attributes, uh, prefix those helper attributes with your crate name to avoid collision. So um, these uh, Sergi, Structop, and Scrum macros are all. Um, whoops. No, okay. Sergi, Structop, and Scrum macros are all crates that provide um, procedural macros. And uh, prop micro derives specifically, and they all have this way of renaming how they serialize things. So, um, unfortunately, we have one inconsistency, but you know, yeah, we try to keep the attribute parameters the same across different crates in the ecosystem. So, yeah, we've got rename all, serialize all, and rename all, but you can tell which uh, crate um, mm -hmm. derives that you are passing that parameter to. Okay, um, learnings, yep. Yeah. Kagura expand helps a lot. You saw the expanded tokens earlier. And if you output non well formed tokens, such as a broken brace, then Kagura expand does not help a lot. Alright. And if you need help, the community Discord server is pretty good. Um, the Macos channel um, so, uh, has a lot of people who will help you pretty quickly when you ask. And a little summary. Okay, uh, uh, Summaries a bit later. So um, you can't pa parse paths in attributes. So right now, Rust allows you to specify crate name colon um, double colon proc record derive uh, name, but you cannot parse that with sin. You you can write your proc record derive with sin, but you cannot parse this with sin point point one five. Um, that will come out in the sorry, sorry uh, support for this will come out in the next version of Sin. We don't know when that is. Um, yeah, output warning to span information. So actually annotate the code where your error happens. That's uh, pending this issue. Okay, so uh, a little bit of uh, info. Um, you could do proc macro derive since Rust one fifteen. Function and attribute was stable since one thirty, and um, yeah, whether you can mutate the input or not. Okay, thanks for uh, hosting us, Great Auckland. And here's some links. And QAC. Well, um, yeah. One of, one of the dangers with the kind of lists macros and C's preprocessor is not the same thing, is that you end up with people writing programs that are unreadable to other people because they've changed the way the language works a little bit. Um, and you mentioned some of the, the learnings, good practices. Are, so really new feature to the Rust is the good best practice guides yet? I have not looked for them, but <laughs> so so far just using Sin's docs and just creating my own macros. I haven't run into too many issues. I know Rust has an API API guidelines book, so um, I haven't checked whether that includes proc macro best practices. Is do most developers in Rust write their own macros? Do most developers in Rust? Um, so, I think most developers would first check crates.io because um, a lot of useful macros are already written there. Uh, for myself, I've only had to write them, say, two or three times because um, most of the other things I want to do are like parsing, um, they're all, they've all got libraries and uh, adding more derives. Yeah. All good? Cool, that's us. Thank you. Thank you.